You know, one of the best things that ever happened to me is that my mother died. Why was that? Because my mother would have babied me, babied me. There's no way I would have ever gotten into a street fight. No way I would have ever been learned to stand up for myself. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice. That's why all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Look, all my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice. That's why all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Hello, welcome to another edition of Club Shay Shay. I am your host, Shannon Sharp. I'm also the proprietor of Club Shay Shay. And one of the reasons that I have a podcast, that I love doing a podcast, is because of things like this. The guy that's stopping by for a drink and conversation, maybe a smoke, but we're indoors and we're not allowed to smoke, once was considered the baddest man on the planet. He's the youngest heavyweight boxing champ, Iron Mike Tyson. Mike, how we doing? I'm doing good, Mr. Sharp. Let's talk about your podcast. You have a podcast called Hot Boxing. Yes. What type of guests do you have on and what do you talk about? Um, I have any kind of guest in the world who's willing to come on and it's wide open. Wide open. So you talk about anything? Anything. You also have a cannabis company. Now, let me ask you this. When you were fighting, did you smoke marijuana when you were fighting? Only at the end of my career. Okay. My la the, last, the last two years of my career, perhaps. So did you ever think marijuana would be so embraced like it is now? And did you think Mike Tyson would one day own a cannabis company? I knew anything is possible. And I know, like I know now, I know cannabis and um, CBD is the future. Right. You can't avoid it. So... Had you known the benefits that you can get from marijuana, would you have smoked earlier in your career? I always knew the benefits, but it was just illegal. It was just illegal. So at no point in time yeah. could you... So even in the off-season, you couldn't partake in marijuana. I, I, can, I understand, like, getting ready for a fight, but let's just say in between fights. You know, um, when my mind is cut off, it's cut off. I don't want it. I don't... If anything I love, like my ice cream, anything, it becomes my enemy. Right. I don't even want to see it. What? Your buck? That's, that's how I got over the weed thing. But then I started smoking again back in, I think, what, 87, 97. Uh, right. So once you got back into it, it was harder for you to say, no, I don't want to do this anymore, huh? I, um, I couldn't stop anymore. <laughs> you couldn't stop or you didn't want to stop? Or had you lost? Go ahead. I didn't want to stop. There's no way I was going to stop it. I'm a totally different person without it than I am with it. I've heard you say that the person that you are now, sometimes you don't like that person because this person that you are now makes you feel weak. Do you believe that you could have been a, a champion boxer back then if you were this person now? No, no, I couldn't have been. This person, um, my my biggest assets is all my flaws. Without my flaws, I'm nothing. Really? Absolutely. So back then you were so you were, you had a singular focus. You wanted to be heavyweight champion of the world, but also the things that made you great made you a very flawed individual. Well, there's nothing wrong with being flawed. It's only only thing wrong with that if you don't know your flaws. At the time, did you know your flaws? Absolutely. You know your flaws when you're born with them. <laughs> you can't hide from them. You can't run from them. What do you think was your biggest flaw? What do you think your biggest flaw was? Um, just not training. Not taking it serious anymore. But so... That was, that was um, in the beginning, you took it serious because I saw the documentary yeah. with you and Cuss when you was up in the Catskills, going to the Olympics, becoming the youngest heavyweight. You don't become that, Mike, if you're not serious, if you're not training. But listen, um, I was beating guys so easy. I, was, I didn't have to train. I was beating them. I wasn't taking it serious. And um, those are bad habits. So do you think if, if you had lost earlier in your career, do you think it would have helped you become a better fighter? 
it was no way I was going to ever lose early in my career. Why? I was just, um, I was, I, hey, I was all defined by God. <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. Jamie Foxx is set to portray your character in a limited series called Tyson. Is that project still set to go? Hey, I don't know anything about any pictures and stuff. I'm just, I'm enjoying the moments I have now. Is Mike Tyson misunderstood? I think we all are. Nobody knows who we are. Nobody knows our shadows. Nobody knows anything about our collective consciousness or uncollective. No one knows anything about anyone. What is so the, I think we all misunderstood. What is the bis biggest misconception that people have about Mike Tyson? I never knew they had one. So the, per the person that we see or the person that we think we know, that's who you are? I can never be that person because I actually don't know who I am. If I knew who I was, I'd be a very limited thinking person at this stage of my life. If you, you had to tell me at 55 years old, I know who I am. You don't know who I know what's going to happen tomorrow. I know it's not going to go any higher than this. This is who I am. Okay, maybe we don't know the future. But I think I would like to think at 55 years of age, you have a better understanding who Mike Tyson is than say when you were 15, say when you were 25 or 40. Or when I was six, or when I become 60. We all <laughs> change in different stages of our life. Do you like the person that you're changing into? Because obviously you say you're different at 20 than you were at 30, than you were at 40, and you're 55. So do you like the evolution of Mike Tyson? Well, it isn't over yet. Mike Tyson is going to be Mike Tyson. It's not that I'm a leveling or something. I just am. But you're constantly evolving. Would you agree? We have to. That's human nature. Yeah, of course I am. But do you? I know uh, some people are, uh, are changing into things they don't like. They don't like what they're becoming. It seems to me that in the beginning, you didn't like who that person was, but you seem to be more at peace with who this person is. I, I would say that's true. What? I was, some of the documentary, and I, I found your documentary very fascinating because I think a lot of, of our, our, our childhood shapes who inevitably we become as adults, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. Do you think if you'd have had a, a two-parent household, a mom, a dad, brother and a sister, loving family, you could have became the heavyweight champion of the world? You know what, um, Mr. Sharp? You know, one of the best things that ever happened to me is that my mother died. Why was that? Because my mother would have babied me, babied me. There's no way I would have ever gotten into a street fight. No way I would have ever been learned to stand up for myself. But what, but what, well, here's the thing though, Mike. When your mom wasn't around me, you probably wasn't still going to encounter some of the people that you had to stand up and protect yourself against. But it was ordained by God for me to deal with that. Do you I don't I don't navigate my life. You think I think I navigate my life to being a heavyweight champion? No, I don't do that. That's God. Let me ask you a question. It seems to me now, Mike, you're you're you are very devout in your faith. When did you become like this? Listen, um, when you get around 51, 52, you start you start to begin a better relationship with God. Okay. Because your expiration date is coming up. Well, who said it is? It might not. You might live another fifty-one years or fifty-two years. No, nah, that's not. That's not happening. <laughs> How do you know? That's you hold on. You just told me earlier that it's ordained by God. You don't know. That's what you told me earlier. I'm not gonna be no hundred and fifty <laughs> years though. That's not gonna happen. What about a hundred? Anything's possible, but I'm not going 150 years old. When did you realize that you be, you could become heavyweight champion? When I was 14. And so what made you think you become you could become heavyweight champion of the world? Well, I had a great mentor, and he always told me, he used to have me do affirmations. So it seems to me, Mike, you're like, at a young age, you were easily convinced. He could have probably told you you could fly a spaceship. And you was like, okay, I'll fly a spaceship. Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> so, 
So, okay, at 14, Cus convinced you, or you start boxing, he convinced you you can become heavyweight champion of the world. I started winning the national championship. I started breaking knockout records. And um, I went to the, I lost to the, to the Olympic gold medal and the box office, box office in Texas. And then eventually I became heavyweight champ. Once I turned pro, my whole life started changing, started beating everybody, beating them just um, viciously. And then everything has changed and I became champion. So you were supposed to go to the 84 Olympics, am I correct? Yes. And that was arguably the greatest team. You had Sweet Pea Whitaker, Mildred Taylor, uh, uh, Holy Holyfield. Amazing team. Incredible team. Unbel <laughs> Immortals, man. Yes. That's the best. Yeah, I think, that, if I'm not mistaken, I think they won nine golds of the 12 that was contested. I think they won a silver and a bronze. Man, listen, they, they weren't playing around. Let's take the current state of the heavyweight division. Let's just say I take a prime Mike Tyson. What do you say your prime your prime age was? How old were you when you say Mike Tyson is at his absolute apex? 22. Okay, Mike Tyson at 22 years of age. How does Mike Tyson beat Tyson Fury? That would be tough, but, you know, there was guys that dropped him that was lighter than me. What was the gentleman that dropped him? Remember that black guy? Yes, he yes. The I, former yes. Yes. The former cruiserweight champ. So, um, and he's not a harder puncher than I am. So I'm able to hurt the big guys. Right. But you got to get inside to get him. He's six foot nine and a half with a, a tremendous reach. How, do you, how does Mike Tyson get inside? I'll try my best and do whatever I know how to do. Let me ask you a question. Let's just say you're a boxing trainer and, 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 and the bronze bomber. Comes to you and say, man, look here. I need one more crack at Tyson Fury. I need you to train me to beat this man. How do you do it? Um, going with the jab, he has to go all out for 12 rounds with him. Can't give him no room to punch. He has to go all out for 12 rounds with him. He can't give him no time by moving around. Can't allow him to think. He allows um, Tyson Fury to think a lot. Right. He gives him a lot of time. Let me ask you a question. Is it because uh, uh, he got into the game so late that he's looking to load up with that one punch? The, like the boxers that came from an amateur's background, they understand, okay, I got to stick the jab. I got to stick the jab. But it seems to me he's just looking to land that one overhand right to turn the lights out of the party. Well, most of the guys that he's fighting are not very elusive, so it's easy to hit them. So he's very confident when he hits them, he's going to knock them out. Right. Are you are you surprised that the fight went the way they went? I'm always um, entertained when those guys fight. I think Dante um, Wilder should fight some other guys too. He he'll be doing he'll do good, man. I just don't him, I just don't want him to get discouraged. He should be very happy and be ready to fight somebody else right away. So, would you think? Do you think it'll be a better fight between Deontay Wilder and Josh and uh, Anthony Joshua? I would love to see that fight, yes. Because both both guys, both guys are, are heavy punchers. I think Joshua is They're gonna be winging. They're gonna be winging. They ain't gonna be much style. They're gonna <laughs> be winging. Um, what about this 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 new thing that's fighting where and you partake in one of them, uh, but you guys were fight uh Roy Jones Jr. and yourself. What was your thought process going into that fight? Were you trying to could could you, were you trying to knock Roy out? No, I would never try to knock Roy, but we're sparring, we're fighting. But the thing is, um, we started a new genre. Now we got guys like Logan Paul doing this right. stuff. So what do you think about that? What do you think about Logan Paul? I think Logan Paul is a big shot in the arm for boxing. No boxer has ever um, brought that many people to um, to the network like um, Logan Paul did. And... Um, I think he's good for boxing. He brings money to boxing. But don't you want to see him fight like a fighter and not fight ex-football players, ex-basketball players, ex-MMA guys? I mean, to give it credibility, Mike, he's going to have to fight someone in that genre. I think he should too, but these guys are very, um, so emotional. They want to fight him so so bad. They forget that he's a trained fighter. Right, right. So, and 
he's going to make them believe that they can really beat this guy because he's white with blonde hair and blue eyes. I'm going to kill him. And then they go in the ring and then something different happens. Yeah, what different happens is that they get touched. You you had yes. you had the famous you had the famous saying, everybody has a plan until they get hit. Everybody says, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna bomb, I'm gonna weave, I'm gonna faint. And then he catches them and like, hold on, wait a minute, that didn't happen. It, they're, they're sleeping. They're sleeping. And I'm looking at guys and I give them one assignment. Do not become a meme. Mike, how do they let the man put him face down in the on the canvas? Hey, listen. That happens in fighting. I don't care how good you are, how great you are. If that don't happen to you at some time in your career, then you're not really a fighter. Are you surprised that, obviously, you, you were the biggest name in boxing and you made a lot of money. Are you surprised that the guys are not as active as you? I mean, you fought one year. I think you fought like 13, 14 fights in a year. Guys fight now once a year, maybe once every 16 months. That's really bad for boxing because boxing is entertainment. Right. And the name of the game, you want the fans to say, when am I going to see that guy fight again? Right. Until you get until you have it like that, you're not going to make the big purse days. Until, it's, until, until the time comes when a guy like Ella Spence is known to a, to a housewife that only go out, oh, she ain't going to take care of the house like a maid. Right. If they know, that's when they know he made it. Well, the thing with you, Mike, is that you were willing to fight. You would fight a Holyfield. You would fight a Razor Ruddick. You fought Bruce Seldon. You fought Frank Bruno. I actually saw the Frank Bruno fight that you fought, uh, the second Frank Bruno fight. These guys now seem to be more concerned with undefeated as opposed to fighting. Earl Spence supposed to fight Bud Crawford. I'm tired of you fighting over here and you fighting over there. Fight each other. Listen, um, and I'm not ever going to say anything disrespectful about fighters, but some people need to have enough pride and say, hey, listen, I want to go on a, uh, a tour of being the best fighter in the world. Who wants to fight me? Right. But the difference is, Mike, is that you was willing to fight and you were willing to put undefeated on the line. But let me ask you this. Let me take it from this approach. If I say, Mike, you can fight John, John Johnson and make $40 million, or you can fight the number one contender and fight 40 million, or the number 15 contender and make 40 million, which one are you gonna choose? The easiest one. And, and so that Mike, that's what we're seeing. That's what's happening with boxing. We want to see the best fight the best. And we're not in the 80s, Hagler couldn't dunk Hearns. Hearns couldn't dunk Leonard. He couldn't dunk Duran. No he couldn't way. dunk Iran Barkley. Yeah, listen, um. He had fought. He had fought Durant, lost to Durant, made Durant quit. Get ready to fight Tommy Hearns. He went up in weight, won the junior middleweight championship, came back and then beat Tommy Hearns. Tommy Hearns and unified the welterweight. <laughs> yeah, that's badass. And the, and you look at the seventies when the the big heavyweight Ken Norton, George Foreman, Joe uh -huh. Frazier, Muhammad Ali. There was no duck. You couldn't duck anybody. They'll fight you in six weeks. After one fight, six weeks later, they'll fight you again. Yes. So why why can't is, is do you think that's one of the reasons that boxing is losing some of its appeal? Appeal, and we get guys that are YouTubers. Go that's ahead. why YouTubers are taking because they're exciting. They're more exciting, more so. They can't fight, but they're more exciting right. than the fighters. Fighters are not fighting competitive fighters. They're fighting guys that they're walking over. So you want to? You want? You would like to see? Earl Spence Jr. And, and Bud Crawford fight. Absolutely. And I want to see Earl Spence go up to 154 and fight the um, Cholo brother, too. These guys can't be, these guys got to want to be immortal. I wanted to be immortal. I want the world to know my name to the end of time. But Mike, they don't look at life. But it seems to me guys want to, guys want to get the big payday, but they don't want to fight the other big payday fighters. They want to try to pick and choose and duck and dodge. It's like, I'm worried about I'm worried about undefeated. These guys are not making that much money because they're not fighting those guys. Right. These guys are not making five, four million dollars and three, three million dollars. They're not making that much money because they're not fighting the right guys. L let me ask you a question. Who do you think pound for pound is the best fighter right now? Wow, that's tough. There's a couple of them out there. 
You have to go with Canelo, but there's still so many the young up and coming lightweights. Canelo's almost on his way out. They got some other guy and what Benavidez. He's a great fighter right. coming up. He'll be great, man. There's so many great fighters out there, man. But that's one thing they have: is great fighters out there. But who do you think? Do you think there's anyone out there right now that can beat Canelo? Because he's gone from 154 to 160 to 168. He's basically wiped out three, four divisions. It's some new guys out there. That, um, the young man, David Benavidez, yes. he's, I call him the man monster. He's tough. I would love to see um, Canelo fight him. You think that fight will happen? God willing, man. If, they, if it doesn't happen, it'll be, you know, man, it'll be, a, it'll just be a shame to boxing. What, what about if Canelo fight one of the Charlo brothers? That would be a very interesting fight, too. So, so they make a lot of money. That's, these are big money fights you're talking about. Right. But I, I, I thought that's what you get. Don't you get in the Obviously, you want to make a name for yourself. You want to go down as an all time great. But I thought it, the, the objective in a sport is to make money. Exactly. And know what? These guys hang around like their buddies. If he was your buddy, he'd fight you, help you make some money. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. I got, uh, I got, I'm unblemished on my resume, though. He might put a blemish on my resume, and then you're going to look at me different and say I'm not the best. No, and then you become better. You become a better champion. You become a better fighter. Life is about loss. As time goes off, the times go, go on, we lose everything. We lose our hair, we lose our teeth, and eventually we lose our life. Life is all about loss. What, let me ask you this. What do you think is the number one skill that a boxer needs to be, to be successful? The desire to win. That's it. That's all you need is the desire, the will to win. If you do you believe that was your best attribute? Yes. So what about what about the uh, uh the right hook to the body and the uppercut, the combo? Nobody's been able to throw that punch like you, Mike. Well, um, I'm very, I don't know, like you say, fighting the spirit. It comes with my spirit. How did you, how did you, how did you learn that punch? Because I've never seen anybody, my, I've never seen anybody put that punch together like you put it together. My mentor, Custy Amato, taught me. Well, it seemed like you was trying to get, you was trying to put that punch on Roy. But Roy, just every time you got close, he grabbed you. Roy said you was not going to put that, 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 that uppercut on his mama child. Well, he's pretty smart. <laughs> Roy's pretty smart. He knows how to avoid punches and punishment very well. Let me ask you a question. Is there another celebrity match that you would like to partake in? I don't know. It's a possibility. People keep asking me, but it's a possibility. Yeah, and you said money. It's a lot of money in it. It truly is. But, you know, um, let's see. You know what I mean? They like God willing. Mike, let that sink in for a second. You're about to be 55 years of age, and people still want to see you fight at 55, as opposed to the guys that's in their tw early 20s, mid to late 20s. They'd rather see you fight than see them. Doesn't that say something about the sport, Mike? That's, that's only by the grace of God, brother. That has nothing to do with me, the sport, you, only by the grace of God. Yeah, it has something to do with the sport, Mike. They, they want to see a 55-year-old that's been retired for almost two decades want to fight as opposed to a 25, 26-year-old that's in their prime. That does say something about the sport, Mike. God is great, brother. Let me ask you a question. You, let me, people ain't qu clamoring for Michael Jordan to come out of retirement, for Kareem and Magic to come, Larry Bird to come out of retirement. You know why? Because Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, LeBron James, all these young guys are doing what they do. So do you think people would be lining up to f spend $70 to see Mike Tyson at 55 if Earl Spence and Keith Thur and uh, uh, Bud Crawford was fighting? Listen, um... The thing is, this is what it is, Mr. Sharp. Okay. When I come, when I come, when I come to do my show, I bring a circus with me. Right. I bring a circus. People like to go to the circus. Yes, it's it. They're not paying for me. They're paying for the circus I'm bringing. Mike, when you fought, when you were in your prime, there was no dilly dallying around. You had to get into your seat. Because if you bull jobbed around and you got, well, I'm gonna make a grand entrance, I'm gonna let everybody see me getting in my seat. The fight's over. You going back to your drop. You going back to the dressing room because you don't knock the guy out. People, it was a book. There was some, there's something about a heavyweight fight. I've only been to a handful, and I've been to one of your fights. There's nothing like it. I've been to a lot of other guys' fight, and I don't want to call no names. 
but there's a buzz around you, around the heavyweights. That's the glory go to God, bro. That's all real. So we don't have to get back into it, but how did the incident in the mid '90s? How did that change Mike Tyson? How did that? Did that? Do you think that two and a half years away from the game of boxing? Do you think that had a bigger impact on any other thing in Mike Tyson's life as a pole in, in boxing? Well, you know, I was never the same fighter after I came out of prison, but I was just, I was still um, learning life. I was, you know, I was making mistakes. I didn't stand on the wall. I did something. But the, the thing, Mike, is that your background, you, I think the thing that I read was that by the time you were like 13, you had been arrested like 38 times. So, yeah, I was a street kid. So I was a street kid. kids do. We get arrested. We rob. We rob people. We rob stores. Anyway, we get money. We get money, and that's why I was arrested a lot of times. But I got away a lot too. Right. Can I? Let me ask you this, Mike. Were you not the same boxer when you came out, or were you not the same person when you came out? Pretty much both. Pretty much both, yeah. When, when were you? When, I looked at boxing, looked at boxing totally as a business. Let's get money, let's get money, and let's try to change our life, get married, and all that stuff. So prior to that, you looked at boxing as entertainment. You, you know, money came along with it because you had tons of money. You had the the White Tigers, and you had the Rolls Royces. You had the big homes, the palatial estates. I didn't have the love for it no more. I lost the love for it. When you were incarcerated, did you spark, Did you do any shadow boxing? Did you do hit, hit the heavy bag? Or did they allow you to do any of that in there? I wasn't allowed to use my, my I couldn't use my, my, my body as a weapon. I couldn't make my body strong because it's a weapon. That's what they told me. So in, my, in, my, in my, my cell, I would just box all day and run in place for two hours. Were you, were you, were you, is, were you isolated or were you in gym pop? I was in population, but I was isolated a lot. I got into a lot of altercations. Hold on. You mean that tell me somebody actually tried you? They knew you were Mike Tyson and people would try you? No, I, I'm a troublemaker. Oh, so you, you know, tried them? I'm, re I'm a real troublemaker. Yes, I am, sir. <laughs> what? Mike, you know you are at a, you are in an advantageous situation. You know. Why would you? Why, why would you say? You know what? I'm just gonna do. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be. A, I'm gonna be a model inmate. I'm gonna do my time. I'm not gonna bother anybody because I know nobody's gonna bother me. You went looking for trouble. Well, listen. I didn't believe I need to be there, and I'm not gonna let any guard disrespect me. So it, you didn't have a problem with the inmates. You had a problem with the guards. Yes. So hold on. I, I just want to make sure. I, was it was it the guards per se or the authoritative figure? Because that's what a guard is. What, no matter what you think about it, he's in an authoritative position. If he's in an authoritative position, he would just say, you have to leave. Or you, you have to do that. He doesn't say, hey, get the hell out of here. Don't move your ass. He doesn't say that. Right. Authority doesn't say that. So you thought they were, you th you thought they were being disrespectful towards you because of who you were? I didn't think of nothing. I, th I thought of the words that he came out of his mouth. You didn't think that he might have had a bad day? I didn't want to hear those words coming out of his mouth towards me. So, Mike, you know people are allowed to have a bad day. Was this a, like a, a regular occurrence, or this wasn't like an isolated, or was it just one or two guards, or was it like the, the general guard population? It was a couple of incidents, but I, I, I rebound and got over those incidents, right. and I became, those, I became almost like a trustee. Okay, we'll see. Mike, I, I think the biggest thing that a boxer can have is like intimidation. You had that because you didn't come out there with no roll bone. You cut the, the hotel towel, draped it over you. You were all black tights, black boots, and you had that. You were glistening. But listen, you know what that is? Intimidation is probably the best. It's probably the best art to have in sports and everything. But sometimes you can scare a guy into kicking your ass. <laughs> so is, is that? So that, let me ask you a question. Let's go to let's go to Japan. I think that was in what 90, 91? when you're Buster Douglas. You know, 
Mike, you know on a given day, you could beat Buster Douglas. If you fight 10 times, you beat him 10 times. 10 times. What happened that night? Um, he was the better fighter that night. It's like, I can't take nothing away from him. I trained hard, really. I could have trained harder, but he really fought a hell of a fight. He did. He stuck to it. Even when you, you dropped him and he got up on the eight count, I was like, well, Mike got him now. Mike put him down. Mike, he's in his groove. And he came back out with the jab and... But check this out, right? By him beating me, he catapulted me to even myth mythological level. I became even a bigger figure after he beat me. Right. And then I went to prison. No, then I beat the number one contender. And then I went to prison. I beat him twice. Then I went to prison, came out, and I won two belts. Right. Do you believe? Then I look. Huh? Do you believe? Let me ask you this. Do you believe had the incident that sent you away for two and a half years, had that not happened, how great a fighter would Mike Tyson have been? If that didn't happen, Mike Tyson would have died. So that was the best thing that ever happened to Mike Tyson. Wow. You really believe that? I know in my heart. You were on that destructive of a path, given who you were? Yeah. Yes, brother. Yes, yes, yes. That was the best thing that ever happened to me as I went to prison. Trust me, Mr. Sharp, I was just living a, a really disgusting life. Kadesh, Mike, when you're alone in your cell, there's no one there but you and your innermost thoughts. What's going through your mind? You know, um, when you think of people in general, you, me, we're mythological, I'm God. We're religious, Allahu Akbar. We're superstitious, but I'm the black cat and don't cross my fucking path. And that's my life. Do you ever ask yourself, I'm Mike Tyson. I got millions. I got 10 houses. I got this. How the bleep did I end up here? Well, um, that's not particularly the question. The question is, what do I do now that I am here? Okay. So what what was a typical day like for, for Mike Tyson when he was incarcerated? You wake up at what time did you have to get up? I got up early, but they allowed me to work out. I could run whenever I wanted to run. I was able to eat any kind of food I wanted. I really had, listen, that was the best three years of my life, really. I had a really, I had a really awesome time in prison. You said you weren't allowed to use your body because they said that was a weapon. Had you been able, yes. when you had you been able to hit the heavy bag, hit the mitts, do things, jump rope, do things of that nature, and you come out, would you have been would you have been a different fighter? No, the only way you become a different fighter is sparring. You have to um, you have to practice what you're going to do in the ring. I wasn't able to do that. Well, I'm sure if they would have let you, I'm sure some of those guys for what you pay a sparring partner would say, okay, Mike. Just go ahead and put this on the books for your boy. Your boy getting in and give you a couple of rounds. Give you a couple of rounds. It doesn't work like that when you're incarcerated, brother. It doesn't work like that. We're on Mr. Gilmore Plantation. <laughs> Mike, you love pigeons. And looking at your documentary and reading a lot of what you say. Hey, you're a great interviewer, man. You're doing good. <laughs> well, you're thank really you. Doing <laughs> well, thank you. What is, it, what is it about pigeons that made you gravitate towards I mean, not eagles, not, I mean, not this, a great majestic bird, a pigeon. People look at pigeons, they say they're flying rats. Exactly, but a pigeon makes you feel like an eagle. It's just the magic they have. We're put on this earth to protect them and take care of them. Right. So, um, I'm reading, you have, you still have, you still love pigeons. How many pigeons do you think you have currently? A couple of hundred. So, so what do you what do you do what do you do with a pigeon? Now I've heard about these pigeon races and people raising pigeons, and they have some that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So what is it that might? No, be? the highest paid pigeon is like one point nine, two point one million dollars. What? A home. Look it up on your, your look it up on your your phone. Yeah, uh, hold on. Somebody paid one point nine two million dollars for a pigeon. Yes. 
the Chinese, some Chinese businessman. Was was he dragging 1.8 million or 1.9 million behind him? No, not at all. A check. And listen, the bird, he can never let the bird out. He's only for breeding. If he let him out, he goes right back to his own. Hold on. So let, let me get, hold on, time out. So in flight. Hold on. So, so let me get this right. If you got a pigeon, you got pigeons, and I say, well, Mike, sell me one of them. You sell me a couple of them. I let the pigeons go. They're going to come back to you? Yes. They're only for breeding. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. How do, how do, how do they, so how do they know to come back to you? It's what they do. That's why they call home and pigeons. They come home. So that, so that's why you like them. You like everybody had Prophet Muhammad, Jesus, everybody had pigeons. Pigeons, pigeons has been around since the beginning of time. They're, um, they're, um, they're done with the, their crap is worth a lot in ancient times. So, pigeon crap. Right. Some people <laughs> like dogs, some people like cats, some people raise livestock. It's pigeons. What is it about pigeons? Is it because, like, when you raise them, they'll never forsake you? They will always come back to its original owner, which is Mike. Well, some of them yes get lost. You can have a bird that you raised. You, he was born in your coop, and he is fly away, and he gets lost. And you would think he has gets lost. No, not no, all, no. Not all. Hey, what if he didn't get lost? What if some like he might have got a hawk, might have got him some other bird of prey? Well, I didn't get him some. I didn't get him. He got lost. <laughs> so, so, so you breed. So you breed pigeons. Yes, I do. So, I want to know some names. What, what's, what's, what's the special type of pigeon? If I were to get, if I were to say, Mike, look here, man, I'm thinking about opening up me a pigeon operation. Also, bro, give me some pointers. What type of pigeon do I need? How many females? How many males? I would say first, what do you want the pigeons for? You want them to make money? You want them to entertainment? You want them for enjoyment? What do you want them for? You want to eat them? What do you, what do you I want? I don't want to eat no pigeon, man. All right, but what, what you want them for? I want it, it seems, to, I want them for what you got them for, for calmness. They, gave, they bring you serenity. They bring you peace. So I wanted the pigeon to do the same thing for you that it d do for me what it did for you. You want rollers then? No what rollers? Rollers do, they fly in the air and they do somersaults. And it's very entertaining. Those are the type of pigeons you have? Yes, I do. And they come in all colors? Any color you would like. So what's the difference between a pigeon that I see in the park and, say, a, a pigeon that Mike Tyson has, not the rollers? What's the difference? The difference is that every pigeon in the world comes from those pigeons in the street. They call rock pigeons, and all the pigeons in the world come from them. It was just a guy. It was a gentleman on Columbus Island. I forgot his name, the doctor, whatever his name was. He started taking every pigeon that had a white, um, a white feather, and he made it them until the until the bird turned all white. Mm -hmm. And so, how many? So you have a couple of hundred pigeons. Do you take them out? So you take them out, throw them up in there. They do somersaults. How? I mean, how long? No. They just open the door and they fly out. Okay, so how long are they out? Um, I leave them out for like what, thirty minutes. Leave them out for thirty minutes and then they come right back. Well, I, I anticipate leaving them for thirty minutes. Sometimes they fly so long it might be two hours. They just stay in the air, even at nighttime. I didn't think they could see at night, you know, Mister Sharp. Right. And I look at night. They're right in the air, in the, I mean, high in the air at nighttime. Can't even see them. They can't see me. And you just leave. And you just leave the coop open, and they'll come back. And they'll come back home. If I let them out at twelve o'clock or something, they'll keep flying till six in the morning. So, so why would you let? Why you? Why do you let them out that that close at at, at dusk? Why, why would you let them out at like noon? The accident. I was just letting them out. And I'm throwing feet as far as I can see them around. I didn't think they were going to fly. I thought to be scared at nighttime. Right. I always thought pigeons at night. I was wrong. Right. Yeah, because I don't normally see pigeons at night. I was thinking that they're like they're day animal because I normally see them walking in the park where I see them flying. So that, that, But they fly at nighttime too and they fly for hours. So if so, if let's just say a boxer comes to you and he says, Mike, what's some of the advice that you'd give me 
as far as not just the ring, but some of the things are like my circle. What are some of the things that you would tell a young boxer? That um, in life, whenever, when life, and ever, and whenever somebody wants to be the best in the world or something in life, there's always going to be some disappointments, and you have to take those disappointments and um, pretty much uh, integrate it with your determination mm -hmm. and never, never lose, and continue to work on your discipline and believe that you're the best in the world or whatever you're doing, and there's never been anyone better. I heard you. I used to. I used to tell people that discipline is doing your very best when no one else is watching. I heard you describe discipline as doing something you hate, but doing as if you love it. Yes. Exactly. Did you hate? I was taught. Go ahead. Excuse me. I was going to say. Did, I, did you hate boxing? No, I hated training. Oh, Sorry. okay. Hey, the training. That trainer is a monster. That's really testing you. So that trainer is a monster. But I did it anyway. So <laughs> everybody always asks me, because I was an ex-professional athlete, about being with women the night of, the day of a game. I guess when you go training, when you go to training camp, is no women allowed. Well, no. Well, it starts out that way, but you know, some guys, some guys do the whole training camp with their family. Right. Depends on the individual. When you went away, how did you do it? Everything shut down. Everything. No, any, no anything. No food, almost. No anything. It's hard work and discipline. How, it's farming. How long? How long was your training camp typically? Six weeks. Six weeks. So, yes. let me ask you a question. When you were in your prime... Yeah. Go ahead. What'd you say now, Mike? I had 15 fights in one year. So you... Hold on. If you had 15 fights in one year, hell, you stayed in camp. Yo, so, yes. I was always training. No, not really training. I was always fighting. Right. Well, we got... We got I had Fights in one week. Yeah, because I was going to say, if you fight in that many, you ain't got no training camp because basically you fight and then two another week later, two weeks later, you fighting again. Exactly. Mike, do you remember, uh, I think it was March or April of 1996, you fought Frank Bruno? I do remember that fight. What do you remember? What do you, what do you remember about that fight? I remember I wanted to win so bad because I wanted to, I just wanted to come out of prison and kind of take over the show again. Right. I remember that, actually, that was my first heavyweight fight. And I remember pe people talking about the buzz that you feel at a heavyweight fight. And they say not just any buzz because you do realize you're going to see Mike Tyson. Well, I had followed your whole career. I knew who you was. I knew what you accomplished. And, and so I'm, I'm excited. I'm like, okay, I'm... There's nothing like that, Mike. Do you do you feel that electricity when you walk into the ring? Can you hear the crowd starting to get into a pitch when you're in your dressing room? Listen, you're you're um, you're an athlete of a very high level. When you're in that mode of relaxation, you can hear and see everybody in the arena. Yes. And my friend, after a fight, I said, yo, man, who's that girl in the red dress you were talking about? He said, Mike, get the fuck out. You did not see in the ring I was talking to that girl. <laughs> I was telling you. It was crazy. You were, very, you were very close to Tupac. And I think that summer, that was when Tupac ultimately lost his life. I think you were fighting Bruce Seldon. Yes. Do you, do you, remember, do you remember that fight? Yes, I remember that fight because I remember talking to Tupac, making sure that he would have the tape because I was coming out out of his um, with his music. Yeah, and I was calling make, make it on time because um, I thought he was gonna be late. Where were you when you got the news that Tupac had been shot, and where did you where were you when you got the news that he had ultimately lost his life? I was in my house because you was back. You was living in Vegas at the time, correct? Yes. 
So I was in my house. I just had a brand new baby girl. Okay. And I and I just couldn't believe it. Cause I told him I'm coming to see you after um I, I get dressed. And then I had to go, I went to the house to see my daughter. And somebody told me he had got shot, but the next morning they had um, released that he had died. Mike, every, I mean, you have one of the most recognizable faces. Everybody knows who Mike Tyson is. You're beloved. I don't think when you were 14, year old, 14 years of age, you thought you would be as loved and revered as you are. Who are some of the most, who are some of the people that you've met that you like, damn, man, that's really cool. I met such and such. I met this person. Yeah, um, when I was in reform school, I met Muhammad Ali, and that changed everything. Wow. So, so what? What did you ask him? Any questions? What advice did he give you? I was far from, but once I saw it, I want to be like that. Right. Because you saw the way the people ga gathered around him. You thought yeah. you saw the aura that he possessed. Yes. So, so when athletes and entertainers they see you now. What do they say to you? They they tell me where they were at certain places when I was doing certain fights. Right. And it about their father, their mother, or they had or they named me after you because I was born in one of your fights or right. something. Do you do you like meeting like Michael Jordan or Magic Johnson or LeBron James or this one? Do you do you get a I mean, are you like when you meet people, do you like, damn, that's pretty cool? Because you see the way they react towards you. You know, um, if anybody gets, it, it humbles you. It humbles you. It's just, I understand why all both athletes respect each other. Yes. Because you have, you have to be around real people and know who you are before somebody tells you who you are. Right. Because as but him, the fathers, we got to take care of our kids and all that superstar, um, iconic shit got to go out the window. <laughs> you know why, Mike? Because as an athlete at the highest level, they understand the sacrifice and the discipline that it takes. And that's what I tell See, people like, I was like, look, everybody doesn't want to be great or want to extend to that top, top level. And that's okay. Some people just want to get a paycheck, go home, and live a nice, quiet, happy life. But if you want to ascend to heights that's never been ascended, there's nothing you can do without sacrifice and discipline. And you're going to have to... Yeah. Go ahead. Some, some people don't... Some people do it. They like to sacrifice, but they don't like what comes with it. They want to sacrifice. They want to go hard. They want to hang out with the boys, but they don't want to come with. Sac they don't want what the sacrifice gives. They want. They don't want that shine. That scares my kids. When people come up taking pictures, scares the hell out of my children. My children say, "See you later, Dad." Boom. Because, let me ask you a question. How many of your kids were around? Were were born when you were fighting? I'm, I'm not 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 at the tail end, but I'm talking about when Mike Tyson was Mike Tyson, Iron yeah. Mike. But when I was that guy, I wasn't a good father. Right. That guy wasn't a cool father. My kids, like a year or two, my kids just started getting tight with me again. But, but Mike, those are the sacrifices that you're talking about that you have to make. You see, you said it yourself. You don't I believe... I understand that. But it's a lot of sacrifice and getting it back together, too. Right. It's the thing. Well, I commend... But the, you have to well, I commend, you for, I commend you for being able to get it back together. Because a lot of times, you know, a lot of times when we, we, we sacrifice, I think what they, they see now, Mike, and you, is that a lot of your sacrifice was for them. You know what? Can I say something, Mr. Sharp? Yes. No, my kids. No, oh, my kids gonna say, uh, my, my grandkids gonna say, wow, dad, granddad really looked out for us. <laughs> <laughs> Dad really looked out. Because you wanted, you wanted for your kids and your grandkids more than what you had. You didn't want your kids or your grandkids to spend one hour in a day that you had as a kid. But listen, this is they couldn't um they couldn't handle what I had. That's why they have the life that they have now. What what uh, what I lived through would kill them. Yes. I tell my kids that all the time. You're not you're not built. To, to go through what I had to go through to make sure that you didn't go through it. Listen, I have a daughter that plays tennis at a high level. But yes, think about this. When I when I lost the fight, it was closer to going back to Brownsville or going back to lockup. When she wins the fight, she goes back to a big mansion, big lawn, property, <laughs> and all that stuff. Right. It was a totally different. 
aphasia. Mike, you've had your, I mean, you once knocked the guy in 30 seconds. You had, uh, uh, start your career, I think you had 17 straight knockouts. When you land a punch, do you know it's a knockout punch when you hit a guy with it? Not all the time, no. Sometimes you throw a punch you thought you missed. The perfect punch, the guy's out cold. He said, damn, I thought I missed that punch. So when you throw, when you, when you throw a punch, are you, are you, are you trying to like, Maybe if I hit him in the chest and he ducked, it'll catch him in his chin? Or am I trying to punch a shoulder? What are you trying to, when you throw a punch, what are you trying to hit? What I'm trying to do is um, put the guy in position for to be able to hit him where I want to. Right. So I you, want him against the wall, against the ropes, standing still with his hands up like this. That's how I want him. So that's when, you go like club, that. that's when you go come with the combo to the body with the uppercut. Because when he comes, when he yeah. when he's like this, you club him to the body, he drops it down, now you come through the guard. Yes, exactly. Who are, you are... I, and I don't When I hit him with the uppercut, it's not hard. But know why they go down? Because they don't see it. Right. It, it's the punch that you don't see that gets you up out of there. Not that hard. The, the punch to the body is harder. But he just comes up and he don't see it, and that's what makes them go down. How do you how do how do you I mean how do you get to the point where you're able to walk a guy into a punch because you're able because I was watching the uh, the Rumble in the Jungle documentary and I was watching how George Foreman was, was like cutting off the ring and in the sparring he was just trying to cut the ring off because he knew he had a feeling that Ali was gonna get on his bicycle so I'm gonna try to cut the ring off how do you walk a guy into a punch you're like okay this is what he wants to do I'm gonna walk him into this listen right. It's almost impossible to walk Muhammad Ali into a punch. But, um, you know, it's all about setting up people in position, almost like playing um, chess. chess. Mm -hmm. That's in the right position to knock them out or to drop them or to hit them. But, you know, fighters got spirit. Sometimes some guys, you got to beat them to death. They just won't quit. George Foreman, Mike Tyson... Of the of the of the heavyweights, who who do you believe is the hardest puncher? God damn! Oh, George Foreman is pretty hard, man. You know what I mean? Just look at all these other guys knock. Look at the modern day heavyweight knockout, and then look at George Foreman knockout. I mean, really, him and Sonny Liston really beat me. They could beat somebody to death. Right, Jack Johnson. Well, yeah, he was great for his time, but I'm talking about fighting guys that really know how to fight. Right. George Foreman, man, God, Sonny, listen, he, that beat men to death. Who, who do you think is the most technical heavyweight? Muhammad. What made, what made Muhammad Ali so special? The desire to win and the ego. So he had to back up on it. After he, done, after he done talked trash to everybody, he had to back that up, huh? But he believed that he was the greatest fighter that God ever created, and he loved himself more than anybody ever loved himself in their life. <laughs> Did you? And you can't beat that. How do you beat that? Let me ask you a question. Did Mike Tyson love himself more than anybody? At, a, at one time, yeah, periods I go up and down with my emotions about me. But it seems that you're in a, Mike, just talking to you right now, it seems like you're in a very, very good place. Yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm in a good place, but anything could change within the drop of an eye. You know, everything's great, but you know, it's Mike, happen, Mike, man. Mike, you have everything. You just talked about the mansion that you got with alarms and you got all the cars. I don't think you got any tigers anymore, but you still got your pigeons. Life is good. Oh, you got no. kids, you got grandkids. You great. Life, life is, is more than that. Life is even more than that. What, what, is, what, what more is to be surrounded by family that loves you and have more and have it all? What don't you have that you, which you, that you would, what, does Mike, what doesn't Mike Tyson have that he wants? I haven't reached, I haven't reached my highest potential yet. What, do you, what does Mike Tyson, okay, let's, can, I, can we project? Over the next two years, what well, if I say at age of 57, Mike Tyson will be? I'll be close to reaching my highest potential. 
that was that's what I'm aiming for. Do you do do you do social media? No, I don't. I don't know how to spell that well, so I wouldn't <laughs> know how to. Do. <laughs> but you know, you know, you know, you can get people to do that for you. Uh, it was just a waste of money to me. Oh. <laughs> just a waste. Of- so you're not big into wasting money anymore. No, um, I'm into really wasting money. <laughs> I used to want to waste money writing for me. <laughs> Mike. I, I really throw it away. I don't play with no money. But but I I, I think the thing is, Mike. So let me ask you a question. When you were when you were growing up and you had these dreams, you were fighting, you're laying in your, in your bed and you're thinking, what were some of the things that Mike Tyson, what were some of the things that, man, if I get this, I would have made it. If I get that, I would have made it. I'm going to have all this. Everything. But once, when I didn't have it, I wanted it real bad. But once I got it, I didn't want it anymore. I heard you say that just exactly what you just said. You said you wanted it all, and when you got it, you was more miserable than when you didn't have it. Yeah, having it all is a different perspective. Mike, let me ask you, you like sports. Who's your favorite, who's your favorite football team? Wow. When um, Lawrence Taylor played with the Giants. You are you an LT fan? Back in the day, I loved LT. Okay, what about basketball? Michael Jordan. I think you like Jordan because his name Mike and your name Mike. We were born in the same hospital. <laughs> the NFL has donated $1 million to, to study the benefits of marijuana. If R- Commissioner Goodell called Mike Tyson in and says, Mike, lay out your best what marijuana does, the benefits that it has as far as pain, because they're trying to get away from the injections. They're trying to get away from the, the, uh, uh, the painkillers, the, uh, the pills. What, what, what would you tell Commissioner Goodell? That you would have to go, um, that is, um, from the history of marijuana, they've been getting the wrong information. They're misinformed about marijuana. It's not a drug, it's a medicine. And um, you could tell there's some guys that gave up their career over marijuana. So um, they ha- it has to make some sense to the people that this is not some um, tox- oxycotton or anything. It only, it only encourages the, the player to play better. Right. My perspective of it, I fight better when I'm on marijuana or some mushrooms. So what is, what is Tyson 2.0? What is that going to entail? Well, Tyson 2.0 is going to detail um, a cannabis company with the um, mushroom situation and the psychedelics. And we're going to really um, pretty much, we're in, we're in what? 18 states, around 400 stores, uh-huh. and our our objective is to conquer the world with our products. So you feel you have the best product? Um, the world told me I have the best product. The world, the world told you that? Yes, I won the contest, all the world championships and stuff. Acting. How did you get into acting? I don't know. I just, <laughs> I have friends that were um, directors and they say, hey, Mike, sit in this movie. Hey, Mike, go do this, do that. And I was never getting paid for that stuff. So um, I started acting and getting paid for it. What's your favorite movie you've been in? The Hangover, big time. Everybody, I, yeah. That was, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was a great movie. Yeah, it put me back on my feet for a minute. Do you, let me ask you a question. Do you ever sit back and watch some of your fights with your kids? Or do you have buddies over sometime and you reminisce and like, okay, let's watch this fight? Sometimes I come in and my kids, my kids and their friends are watching some of my fights. I say, hey, we can't do that in here, okay? Chill out. We got to be on human mode here. Why you, why, no celebrity. Why you don't, why, why you don't want the kids to watch it? But sometimes after the fight, I may have called my mother or something. I was cursed at somebody. I'm right. Like, oh, God. I want to get, get you out of here on these last few questions, Mike. Tyson Fury, Francis Ngannou. Do you think that, do you want to see that fight? 
Yeah, I don't mind watching it. Oh, I'm talking about a box. Not oh, not MMA. Let, let's let's be specific. A boxing match. Would you like to see a boxing match with Tyson Fury and Francis Ngannou? I like to see anybody fight. Oh, you just like I'll see two. <laughs> <laughs> so you just want to see a fight? Yeah. What do you think about Conor McGregor? Great showman. Do you think he should box? Do you think he should like leave MMA and come over and, and box? Whatever he's gonna do, he's gonna make a shit ton of money. He is. He is. Because he can sell a fight. He he's as he's as good at selling a fight as anybody that we've had in the bit. He might, he might, he might rival Ali. I don't think he's as, as witty and as clever as Ali, but he can sell a fight, Mike. He can sell a fight. People that and they said, no way, he ain't nowhere near Ali. I said, this guy's a this guy's a circus show too. He's a traveling circus. Yes. Yes, he is. Mike, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day and giving me a couple oh, of minutes, my bro. Pleasure. Talk to you, brother. Man, I appreciate it. Best of luck. Whatever you do, keep conquering the world. I'm glad of the man that I'm interviewing right now. I'm glad what you turned out to be, bro. I really appreciate you. Um, love, brother. All the best. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice. Got to roll the dice, that's why all my life, I've been grinding all my life, look. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice. Got to roll the dice, that's why all my life, I've been grinding all my life.